Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants Hangout. Uh, my name is Joe Borowski, and I'll be your host today, and I'll actually be the presenter as well. So um, recently I returned from a trip to the Galapagos uh, with National Geographic and Lindblad Expeditions as part of the Grosvenor Teacher Fellowship. Uh, every December they open up the fellowship to teachers across North America who are doing really interesting things to try and open up um, their classrooms to the world through geography, through science uh, and such. And this year I was selected as one of 30 teachers uh, to go on expedition with Nat Geo uh, and Lindblad and they sent us all over the world to places like the Arctic, places like Antarctica, places like the British Isles. And I was really lucky to go uh, to the Galapagos, which is a little group of islands I've wanted to visit for as long as I can remember. And being a science teacher, um, there are really significant, um, really significant islands to me with their history. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna share my screen with you and we are going to uh, see some of my images from the Galapagos. I'll describe some of them to you. Um, kind of take you on a little virtual trip to the islands and then uh, we'll switch over to some Q&A from there. So, loading up on your screen now. Oops, let me just fix that. Try switching it over. Not cooperating at the moment. Okay, there we go. Um, let me know if you're having problems viewing the slides, but it looks like it's popped up okay. So, the Galapagos are a tiny little group of islands off the coast of Ecuador. So, you can see here in South America. Here's Ecuador, and about a thousand miles off the coast is this little group of volcanic islands known as the Galapagos. If we jump in a little closer, you can see more of the archipelago now. So um, the islands form over a hot spot, which is right there on the seafloor, right in this area. Please excuse the interruption. And I'm sure I've got an announcement on my end. We'll just let that go. We just wanted to let everyone know that there is a football game going to be starting at St. James later this afternoon. And so they will be out probably on the field during recess. So we ask all of our students to stay on this side of the path. So there will be no students allowed in the St. James end zone. And also the uh, grade sixes that usually play against the wall, we will not have that today as well. Thank you. Okay, so a little bonus information for you. We have a football game and we're restricted in our schoolyard a bit today. So, uh, continuing on, the islands slowly move on a conveyor belt from the west to the east with San Cristobal over here and Espanola being the oldest islands and Isabella and Fernandina being the youngest islands in the archipelago. And actually they're very active. Just recently last year, Wolf Volcano uh, erupted on Isabella. Okay, so this is the islands. We landed here on Baltra, which is also called um, South Seymour. We spent some time in that area. We spent time on Rabida over here and South Seymour before moving around and spending time on the youngest island, Fernandina. We then spent a good portion of a day and a half exploring Isabella. From there, we did Santiago. We spent a day on Santa Cruz. And our final day in the Galapagos was spent on San Cristobal before flying back to Ecuador from there. So we're gonna visit some of the islands here. So this is the ship, this is the National Geographic Endeavor. It holds about 90 people. And it's a special expedition ship along the back there's a big stack of zodiacs, which we use to we probably hopped into the zodiacs, I'd say three or four times a day to go on different hikes, to go to different snorkeling locations, and to go to different um, zodiac spots. Sometimes we just go along the shoreline and look for uh, creatures. So this is the National Geographic Endeavor. And actually, it's retiring this year. It's going to retire, and the National Geographic Endeavor, too, will start running uh, in the Galapagos. This is South Seymour. Yeah. 
Sorry for the interruption, but your slides are very small. It's not like a full screen of the pictures. Is okay. it possible to make them full screen? We have like your note view, so we can see where you clicked add meeting notes for the slideshow. Okay, I've got them full screen on my size, but let me try something here. Thank you. Let's bring that up for you. Marcus Tran, please come to the office for a moment. That didn't really help. Okay, someone just give me a signal and let me know if that's better. If you can now see them full screen. Okay, I'm going to guess that we're going full screen now because now I see the small view. So you guys should see the full screen now. But let me know if it didn't change. So um, this is North Seymour. And this is a beautiful island covered in different bird species. And the Galapagos is really unique because you can literally walk up to all the animals um, and they are very, very, not tame, but not afraid of humans. They grew up in isolation without humans, so um, they don't view us as a threat. Um, as well, it's really unique because you can watch their behavior. You can see them behaving normally, even though you're only sitting six feet away. They go about their business as if you're not there. So this here is the blue-footed booby, and you can see it has two chicks that it's raising. Um, very unique, their feet. This one here is doing a little bit of a mating dance. So it raises its feet and shows its feet to the female as a way of showing that it's very healthy and it would make a very good mate. So the bluer the feet, the more healthy the blue-footed booby is. It's getting more food, it's getting lots of fish, so it would be a good choice. Um, another part of this mating ritual, this dance, is the sky point. So when they catch the female's attention, they'll arch their back, point their wings and head to the sky, and they'll give out a, a little call. So that's the sky point. And the male that you just saw the photographs of, he was very persistent, but in the end the female flew away, so the feet must not have been blue enough. This is a male frigate bird, and you can see here they have a big pouch that they inflate uh, with air, and they can keep that inflated for several days. And again, this is used in mating as well. As a female flies over, it'll shake its wings, it'll shake the pouch, and try to get the female bird's attention. Um, and this guy here, the whole time we were on the island, you could hear him calling, and any time a female bird flew over, he'd try his best to get her attention. Uh, very expensive. It takes a lot of energy to keep this pouch inflated for such a long time. Here's a land iguana. Uh, these guys are really neat. They have a little territory with a prickly pear cactus that they protect. Um, they keep other iguanas out of that territory, and every once in a while they take little bites out of their own personal prickly pear. Looks like little cookie cutter bites. And they will fight quite um, viciously to hold on to those territories and keep their own plant to themselves. We move to another island called Rabida, and Rabida is this beautiful red colored island. It uh, gets that color from the volcanic rock, the iron in the rock exposed to the elements over time, um, eventually almost rusts when exposed to um, the elements. Beautiful red color. We did some snorkeling along Rabida, and the Galapagos is infested with Pacific green sea turtles. All that green algae you see growing on the rocks is a wonderful buffet for the green sea turtles. Sometimes I'd look around and see 11, 12, 13 sea turtles uh, in a really small area. So it was an absolute blast to snorkel in the Galapagos, very rich in life. There's another shot of a sea turtle. And then here is a um, chocolate chip starfish. We're a group that may have just popped in. If you don't mind muting your microphone, because we can hear your class talking in the back. I just want to check to see if your microphone is uh, muted. So I think you can see why this is a chocolate chip starfish. It looks basically like a chocolate chip cookie. 
also on Rabada, we saw some Galapagos mockingbirds and um, really neat species of bird. Not afraid of us at all. We're fighting in between our legs as we were walking. And you can see two uh, birds here. On all of the islands, you can find Sally Lightfoot crabs, beautiful red colored, uh, scurrying over the rocks. Uh, when they were younger, they were a dark black, but then as they mature, they take on this red and yellow uh, coloration. You can find these guys on pretty much any of the islands. The marine iguanas were a real highlight. These iguanas are unique in the world. They're the only species of iguana that can swim in the ocean and find their food. So they head out early in the day, dive down, eat algae off the rocks. This cools them down, so they have to come back up onto the volcanic rocks and they warm up in the sun. And then they spend the rest of the day sneezing all over each other. So the salt in their bodies comes out through a, gr a gland in their nose and to get it out of their body, they have to sneeze. So a little bit further on, we'll see some of that sneezing in action. So there's another marine iguana just enjoying a rest in the sun after a swim. There's a few more. Uh, on Fernandina, the algae was so rich and growing up onto the land that the marine iguanas didn't have to dive down deep. If they didn't want to, they could have found some food right on the land. This is a view from Fernandina looking out onto island, uh, the island of Isabella. You can see a couple of the volcanoes in the background, and then you can see the National Geographic Endeavor waiting for us to come back. This, you may know cormorants if you live by, say, a big lake or the ocean. These uh, normally can fly and hunt fish in the water, but the species that lives in the Galapagos have lost their ability to fly. Um, being on the islands for so long um, and with no predators, uh, over time, the wings became vestigial, no longer necessary for uh, the bird to survive. So big, strong legs for the water, but very small wings that no longer give it the ability to fly. And this guy here is bringing some seaweed to his mate. Um, what they do is they'll bring back a gift and apparently seaweed is a pretty fancy gift for a female cormorant. And he was going back and forth bringing her little gifts of seaweed. You can see he's delivering it. You can see the female sitting here and the two chicks sitting up there. So. He's gonna dry off in the sun now, like he's doing with his little wings, and she's gonna take her turn in the water to go find some fish for the chicks. This is Isabella, you can see the volcanic landscape. This is at sunset. Isabella is shaped like a seahorse. This is right near the equator, and this is the tip of the nose of the seahorse of Isabella. There's another shot of some of the volcanic features on Isabella. This is Isabella as well. This is a parasitic volcano cone that's filled with lake water, okay, with fresh water. And you can see the ocean on the other side, and there's the National Geographic Endeavor. On Isabella, you can find giant tortoises. And as you can see, if you lay down uh, with your camera, they'll walk right past you, again, having no fear of humans. Okay, and on each of the different islands uh, in the Galapagos that do have tortoises, uh, good naturalists are able to identify them based on their shell features. So um, having been in isolation from each other for so long, uh, they did start to develop different features uh, based on the islands that they were living on. There's another shot. And eventually I just had to roll over and get out of the way or this tortoise would have walked right over me in slow motion. Here's another land iguana. And from this picture, you don't see that there's another land iguana close by. They stumbled into each other's territory. And uh, actually got into a little fight. There was a lot of head bobbing. There was a lot of posturing. They started to run into each other, push each other with their heads. And eventually one gave up and left. So we got to see a little territorial fight. This is a Galapagos hawk. They're the biggest predators in the Galapagos. Okay, they hunt things like young marine iguanas and small lizards. 
and uh, can be found on most islands in the Galapagos. We moved on to Santiago, and a beautiful thing about the Galapagos is the beaches. Beautiful beaches, um, pretty much untouched, and these beaches make the perfect breeding grounds for Galapagos sea turtles, uh, the green sea turtles. They pull themselves up on a shore at night, will head right back by those bushes, and they'll dig up the sand and bury their eggs. Later the eggs will hatch, and they'll make their way back uh, to the ocean. Another view from Santiago, looking out over a little lagoon. And then right while we were waiting for the zodiacs, a rainbow started literally from the back of the uh, Endeavor, which is kind of cool. Now you have to be careful when you're snorkeling. Um, sometimes you might get the urge to show off if say something like a glass bottom boat goes over. Um, the Endeavor does have a small glass bottom boat, so people who don't want to snorkel can use that. And I was swimming back and forth underneath and waving, and a little piece of the reef, the rocky reef was sticking out, and it hit me in the back. So not a big deal, just had to get a little disinfectant from the ship's doctor. This is Santiago, this is a male lava lizard, and this is a female. So what's really unique here is usually the males have the more coloration um, to attract the attention of the females. And then the females are usually a little drabber, helps them with camouflage. But in this case, uh, we have more coloration in the female lizard. One of the best things about the Galapagos was uh, snorkeling with the sea lions. Um, the young sea lions were a ton of fun. They swim circles around you, do somersaults, sneak up and blow bubbles in your face, try to reach behind and pull your flippers off. Uh, just absolute ton of fun. So neat to see on land, but even more fun to be with uh, in the water. And you can see sometimes they disagree with each other and they get into little fights. And then this was a pup. This pup was probably just over a week old. And you can see that it's enjoying uh, a little bit of milk from its mother. And so for the first little while of its life, it will depend fully on the mother before it's able to go into the ocean and find some food of its own. And in different spots, there was little tidal pools, so little pools of ocean water uh, surrounded by rock. And this was kind of like a little nursery hangout. So the little seals, when they get a little bit bigger, the sea lions, they can swim around uh, in there and they're safe from predators in the water. Here's some of the marine iguanas in the sun. And if you look at this one, I'm going to go back and forth a couple times. You can see this one here uh, is sneezing. So it is getting some salt out of its body after having been in the water looking for food. And if we go back and forth, you can see the sneeze in action here. I'll have to turn it into a little, a little gif later. But basically, if you're walking along the lava shore and the sea lions are sunning them, or the sea lions, the marine iguanas are sunning themselves, you just hear a lot of sneezing as they're getting salt out of their bodies. This is on Santa Cruz, a little town called Porto Aera. It's the largest uh, inhabited spot in the Galapagos. So there's three little spots where people live, and about 18,000 people, I believe, live in Porto uh, Aera. And you can see it's unique. Not many places do you have to step over a sea line sleeping on your way to get into the bank. The Charles Darwin Research Center is there, and there's all kind of programs on the go right now where they're trying to get rid of invasive species, so animals brought to the islands that don't belong. And they're also trying to help repopulate um, the species that are in trouble. So some of the endangered species on the islands, they're working uh, with breeding programs. So one that they have there is with the giant tortoises. And they're working really hard to get their population numbers back up in the wild. So another example of a program is there's a fly, a little fly that seems harmless, but it gets into the nests of um, mangrove finches and it feeds on the skin and the blood of the little chicks. Now, that's caused their populations to crash to a levels 
where right now there's only 20 breeding pairs left in the Galapagos, so about 40 birds. So the center right now has a two-part program. On one hand, they're trying to find a way to get rid of the flies without hurting the native insects. And on the other one, they're trying to hand rear these mangrove finches and put them back into the wild. So if you can't tell, it's a very complicated program to try and raise these flies in captivity, find out ways to wipe them out without hurting native insects, at the same time raising the chicks in captivity and releasing them back into the wild. So it's a very expensive and complicated program. We went up into the highlands of Santa Cruz and you can see that they're very green and lush, very different from most of the other islands, almost like you entered almost a rainforest environment. And up here, the Galapagos tortoises just roam through the fields, uh, feeding on different grasses and shrubs. Um, you can see he's having a good little munch there. This picture gives you a good size comparison. We've got this duck here, and you can see how its size compares to one of the giant tortoises. You can see that they live up to their name, if this is how big it is compared to a duck. And they're just wallowing in a little lagoon. Here's another one eating in the forest. All right. So the last island we visited was San Cristobal. And this was a beautiful island, had some beautiful beaches. Um, we did some hiking through the foothills. You can see some of us here moving through. And this island was unique because it was the only spot where you could find all three species uh, of boobies breeding there. So the Nazca, the red-footed, and the blue-footed booby. So you already saw the blue-footed. This is a Nazca booby. And then here is one of the red-footed. So it's a spot where you can find all three of them on, this, uh, on the same island. We watched this little drama play out here. This is a frigate bird in the air, and these, this is a blue-footed booby and it's chick. Now the frigate birds are called pirates of the sky because they don't actually catch their own food. They don't actually hunt for fish usually. What they'll do is they'll harass other birds until they spit up their food and they'll eat it that way. So this one here knows the mother just returned to her nest and he's trying to harass them to get uh, the fish regurgitated for itself to eat. So probably for a span of about 20 minutes, we could hear them going and calling and the, boob the blue-footed boobies have very sharp beaks so the frigate bird doesn't want to get too close. So this, that battle went on for a good 20 minutes before the frigate bird gave up and moved on to see if it could find another bird to give up its it's lunch. Another view of the Endeavor from San Cristobal. This is another beach on San Cristobal, so we get in the boat and oftentimes we visit two or three spots on the same island. Uh, beautiful blue waters here and sea lions, those little dots you see are just sea lions lounging on the beach. You can watch the pelicans hunting, diving down looking for some fish. There's another example. Okay, so that's as far as I want to go with the pictures for now. So as you can see, the Galapagos is um, an amazing place. It's really unique um, in the world. So I should be back now. There we go. It, you find species nowhere else in the world. So endemic is the word that scientists use. And endemic means you can find species there that are found nowhere else in the world. So um, between the amazing species, between the volcanic history, um, it's just an amazing place to visit. And even though that whole group of islands is only about 100 miles across, maybe just a little over 100 miles, every single island was completely different. And every single island had um, its own unique set of species. So when those islands formed, uh, millions of years ago, there wasn't any life on them. Through storms and other things on the mainland, uh, iguana species or turtle species or other lizard species could be swept out into the ocean, end up on big rafts of floating uh, palm trees and tree trunks and branches and such, 
and drift out to the islands. So that's how scientists believe that most species made their way to the islands. And then with each island being separated by spans of ocean, um, over time, the same species of marine iguana or tortoise or um, Galapagos mockingbird evolved differently to have slight variations than other species on the other islands. So it's an absolute paradise for scientists and biologists alike. Um, a place where 10 days just wasn't enough time to take it all in. Um, for your teachers, I'm not going to share the video today because our internet's running slow at the school, but if you do go to the Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants YouTube page afterwards, you can find a video of uh, swimming with a sea lion, so you can see what that was like, and then there's a 360 video of a marine iguana who knocked down uh, my 360 camera and started licking the lens, so it's a pretty cool video to check out, so you should check those out afterwards. But now what I'd like to do uh, is jump over and I'd love to take some of your questions um, that you may have uh, about the Galapagos or any animals or that you saw today. So let's jump to our first group in Gorey, Ontario. They're a grade five, six. Um, we have Mrs. Donnell's group joining us. I'm just gonna turn your mic on. Okay, so you're gonna go in front of the camera, yeah, and you're gonna ask them. Uh, how does the volcano erupt in Isabella? Okay, um, we just have an announcement about to come on Bella my end. Novak. Just gonna give that a sec. Okay, there we go. So I did mention that there's a hot spot um, on the western side of the Galapagos, and that is where the material, the molten rock, does come and form those islands. Um, so what usually happens with a volcano is that the uh, material moving up from the hot spot uh, below the ground uh, builds up in a chamber below the volcano. Um, eventually that pressure builds up to a point where it can't be held back anymore and we have an eruption. So steam, gases, and the molten rock are released from, um, are released from the earth. So about a year ago, Wolf Volcano erupted and what was really unique was the Endeavor had a, a group of um, tourists on board and they diverted the ship so they could go and photograph and view this event because you don't often get to see uh, a volcano that has erupted and to see the lava moving down the coast and and into the ocean so a really unique opportunity for people lucky enough to be on board last year you guys have one more question yeah, yeah. Um, was there any type of sharks there Good question. There are lots of species of sharks in the Galapagos. Um, there's Galapagos sharks, there's silky sharks, there's white tip reef sharks, and there's hammerheads. Um, further to the north are two little islands called Wolf and Darwin. And those islands um, are protected now and the waters around them because it's the largest aggregation of uh, those species of hammerheads in the world. So lucky divers who get to go that far north can be uh, in the water with hundreds of hammerheads at a time, just these massive schools of hammerheads. So uh, if you look it up, uh, Blue Planet, I believe it was featured, and I'm sure if you look up hammerheads in the Galapagos online, you can get an idea of what it's like to be swimming with so many hammerheads. Um, the only sharks we saw during the week were white tip reef sharks. Um, we saw them a couple of different times that we were snorkeling. And again, they're more scared of us than we are uh, of them. All right, I'm gonna to jump to our class joining us in from Acton, Ontario. They're joining Mr. Londos in the library. And the two classes are grade six, Mrs. Zuzik and Miss, oh, Mr. Zuzik and Mrs. Bale. So go ahead if you guys have a couple questions. Uh, how many species of birds are there and how many at, are at risk? That is a really good question. And I don't have that number off the top of my head. But the Galapagos is an area where you don't find a huge number of bird species because it is so far from the mainland. So lots of seabird species, like those three species of boobies and noddies and the pelicans 
And then you get a few land species as well. So you have yellow warblers, which we saw quite a few times. Um, the Galapagos finches, which are pretty famous, right? They say that those had a big part in Darwin and his theory of evolution. But actually, um, the Galapagos mockingbirds and the tortoises played a role as well. The finches didn't have quite as big of a role as, as the myth, as the story uh, has been told. Um, which other species? The Galapagos mockingbird, yeah, four of those. And then the finches, you can tell the different species of finches. Sorry guys, just let me shut the door. Sorry guys, we just had recess end here and the classes came in kind of loud, so uh, we're good now. So the finches have all different size beaks. The really big thick beaks are for breaking up seeds. The really thin beaks are for eating insects. And then some finches use cactus needles to get grubs out of trees. And other ones drink blood. There's actually a species of blood drinking finch in the Galapagos. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Londos' group, if you have another question. What's the climate like? What's All right, great question. So, being right on the equator, uh, it is uh, kind of a tropic. Uh, climate throughout the year. Um, we were there in what's considered kind of their drier time. So it didn't get quite as hot during the day as it would have more in the heart of the summer, but still up in the mid 20s. Um, what's really unique about the Galapagos is the currents. So warm water and cold water con currents all converge right in the Galapagos. Um, these cold water currents bring tons of nutrients uh, into the waters, meaning lots of sea life and fish life can survive. And the cold water currents also allow things like the Galapagos penguin to survive uh, in an area where you wouldn't usually expect penguins. And you can also find fur lion seals and sea lions. So sea lions are found in warm climates. Fur seals are in colder climates, but with the cold water currents and the heat of the equator, you have both species that can survive on the same islands, on the same beaches. So it's actually pretty cool. That's a good question. Uh, I'm going to jump to our next group. We have Mrs. Gotowski's group joining us from Campbell, California, and they're a grade four or five class. I'm just gonna pop your microphone on now. Okay. Thank you. Um, how do the male sea lions um, pretty much show off to the lady sea lions? Okay. Well, that's a really good question, and we saw some of that in action. So, what they do is the male ones are big, up to 400 pounds, and what they'll usually do is they'll get a beach area that they protect and that they hold on to. And then the females will live on that beach. So I apologize, guys. We have another announcement interrupting us. Okay, there we go. Um, and they defend those beaches from other uh, males. So their size is important and their ability to fight off other males is what impresses the females and keeps the females on their beaches. So if a male loses the fight, they lose its territory, and they have to move on. So, good question. And we'll grab another one if you have it. Um, is the water warm, and do you know why? Okay. The water in the Galapagos is not warm. You have to wear a wetsuit when you snorkel. It's probably about 60 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Um, and it is because of those cold water currents. Those cold water currents from the deep water hit the islands and rise to the surface, um, bringing lots of nutrients, but keeping the water at a cooler temperature. So uh, 
majority of the year, the waters in the Galapagos are not warm? That's a good question. Mrs. Murray's group, they're joining us in Ohio. Oh, yeah. there you go. And they are a grade three classroom. So go ahead if you have a couple questions. Hi, my name's Chloe, and have you ever got sneezed by a marine iguana? <laughs> That's a really good question. I, um, I did a few times because I really wanted to catch those pictures of the sneezing in action. So for some time, 10, 15 minutes, I would sit and take lots of pictures over and over and over to try and get that shot. So a few times I was in firing range of the salty sneeze. So yeah, it did happen a few times, but the plus size is I got the pictures that I wanted to get. Good question. Thank you. Just, Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, my name is Paige. Um, did you ever get to set up camp on any of the islands? Okay, well this is a good question because it's gonna lead to talking about how they protect the islands. So the Galapagos, have been in trouble. Um, sailors used to visit them and take tortoises and other animals for food. They brought creatures like goats and horses and pigs um, onto the islands. Um, people don't often take care of them the way that they should. They were taking some of the corals. All kinds of things were happening in the Galapagos um, that were hurting them. So a few years ago, the government really took it to heart that the, these islands need to be protected. So you can't camp on the majority of the islands. I think there's one or two spots near some of the, one of the three cities where you can camp, but the majority of the, the islands, you can't be on them between six at night and six in the morning. Um, groups no bigger than 16 can be in a spot at any given time. Um, you have to be the naturalist at all times. There's pathways that are marked out. You can't leave the pathways. So they work really hard to protect those islands. So there was no camping. Um, by six o'clock at night, we had to be back on the boat. And so we had things there, presentations, great meals. Uh, we'd share our pictures. And then while we slept, oftentimes the boat would move to a new island. And we'd wake up in the morning and have a new island for us to explore with the zodiacs and through snorkeling. So they do a really good job uh, protecting the Galapagos, where in the past they hadn't. And it's paying off. The populations of uh, giant tortoises are growing. The sea turtles and other animals are having a chance now uh, to grow and to thrive, where a few decades ago things weren't looking so good in the Galapagos. That's a good question. And our last group, Mrs. Dominsky's group, um, are joining us. And you'll have to just remind me um, where you're joining us from because I had your group down for the Monday, but we're more than happy to, join, to have your group joining us today. Niagara Falls, Ontario. Perfect. So we got a group from Niagara Falls. Go ahead with your question. What was the best view you saw or the favorite island you visited? Fernandina was my favorite by far. Fernandina is the youngest island, and it's an island that's much more protected than the others because when sailors first visited a few hundred years ago, um, there was no source of water. And if there's no source of water, the island didn't have a lot of use for them. So to give you an idea of what it's like to be on Fernandina, you could be standing on the shore looking at the big volcano, the shield volcano that makes up the island. You can look across the little channel and see four of the volcanoes of Isabella. There were hundreds of marine iguanas on the shore with sea lions. There were flightless cormorants. You could look at the water and see 12 or more sea turtles floating and just breathing, right? Because they can stay underwater for a long time, but they do need to breathe eventually. It was just a magical island full of life and um, yeah, just a real treat to visit. So a lot less of an impact than of humans than on some of the other islands in the Galapagos. And it's also the youngest island, so it was neat to see some of the features of the, the fresher lava flows and to see the actual shield volcano that makes up the island. So it was pretty cool to see. And we'll pop your mic on one more time. Thank you. 
What was the most dangerous place you approached or the most exotic place at the Galapagos Islands? Mm. Uh, so I'd say maybe the most dangerous was on our first snorkel in Rabada. Not that the currents were dangerous or the water or the sea creatures, but there was one in particular that's called a scorpion fish. And they blend into the bottom. They look just like a rock, but they have poisonous spines of self-defense. So if you accidentally touch one, it wouldn't be a good thing. Um, they're the most venomous creatures in the Galapagos. So again, they're not chasing you. They're not trying to poke you with a spine. It's their defense. If something tries to eat it or touch it, you get that dose of poison. So <laughs> we thought we might see one or two, but on our little snorkel in Rabada, we probably saw um, well over a dozen. So not that we were ever really in danger. You just had to be careful if you put your hand down and I definitely wouldn't want to hit my back on the bottom because you never know if there's a scorpion fish there. All right, uh, good questions. So um, I want to thank you guys for hanging out today. I know it was a little chaotic. We had that group come in after the recess bell and then we had uh, seemed like a steady parade of nonstop announcements. So uh, thanks for sticking around and exploring the Galapagos with me. Um, you can find those videos that I told you about on our Explore My Seed Your Pants YouTube page. Um, the video with the sea lion and the 360 video with the iguana. And if you check back from time to time, I'll be posting more 360 pictures as well as more videos from the trip. It just takes a while to actually edit all the pictures and all the videos. So um, yeah, I'd like to thank you guys for hanging out. I hope you learned a little bit about the Galapagos and why I think they're so special and so amazing. And uh, if you have any more questions um, that you want to give to your teacher, they can email me and I'm more than happy to answer those through email. And uh, I hope every one of you gets to experience the Galapagos um, some way in the future. And I highly recommend doing it with National Geographic and Lindblad Expeditions. They're, it was an absolute blast to hang out with uh, them. And their naturalists are second to none. I learned so much in the 10 days that I spent there. I'm still trying to process all the information. So thanks everybody, a lot of fun hanging out and uh, hopefully we'll see your classes again in the future. All right, thanks everybody.